Welcome one, welcome all, whether you're watching live or whether you're watching another time. I want to thank you for coming to join together. We are looking at Daniel chapter 12 as we journey through the book of Daniel and we are in part 7 in Daniel chapter 12. And in fact, we are still in the first verse. So much happening in the first verse for us to comprehend and understand which God is trying to reveal to us. So we are concluding verse 1 today with uh, the book of life. So the names in the book of life and what does it mean? How do we understand what is this book of life? That's what we're going to study. Before that, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for the breath of life. Thank you for the privilege for me to help um, do this presentation. Thank you for giving me the understanding and the resources to put the presentation together. Now, be with us now as we understand your words. May your Holy Spirit lead and guide our thoughts. And I pray that you would keep Satan and his angels out of the base under the hearing of your words. May this understanding prepare us and prepare others for your soon and imminent return. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So here at prophecylife.org, we are always learning from the past to understand the present and prepare for the future. This happens week after week and in every study. And that's what we're going to do even today. But we have an outreach tool that we always try to promote. If you'd like to have it, you can find the electronic copy on the website, prophecylive.org. It is a 40-page A5 size concise booklet talking about the past, the present, and the future. So to say, important aspects of human necessities of life that is on earth, how it will all come to an end. And that's what we're going to study. You want the hard copy, get in touch with us through prophecylive.org and we shall provide it to you. There is a final events of Bible prophecy chart and its explanation of how things will wrap up in the future for us on planet Earth. I keep saying week after week, enter the ark of hope. And I would say that again to say that the great controversy between God and Satan began in heaven. And it was over the law of God. Satan determined to himself that there is another way other than keeping the law of God. And therefore, here we are on this earth. What does it mean today in this 21st century? One word, worship. Who will you worship? The Lord God that created heaven and earth and all that in them there is. Or the God of this earth, which is Satan. There is no third option. That is why it's good to study, understand the great controversy and make an informed decision whom to worship. Get into the ark. God is in the most holy place. Passing judgment, he's sitting on the throne. The base of his throne has the Ark of the Covenant, that is his foundation, inside which is the law of God. Therefore, get into the Ark of the Covenant, meaning abide by the law of God, because Jesus is simply saying, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. That's what he said. And he said, thy way, Lord, is in the sanctuary. How great a God is our God. And that is why it is important for us to understand what God wants of us. Health snippet again. We're continuing now on ginger again. We're looking at the health benefits of ginger. It's still a food, so it's not a medicine. But if you have any concerns of its consumption for remedial purposes, I would recommend seek medical advice if you have any concerns. Ginger is among the healthiest and most delicious spices on the planet. It is used fresh, dried, powdered, or as an oil or juice. It is a very common ingredient in recipes. It's sometimes added to processed foods and cosmetics too. First point regarding health. It contains ginger oil with powerful medicinal properties. So the ginger has a very long history of use in various forms of traditional and alternative medicine. It's been used to aid digestion, reduce nausea, and to help fight flu and common colds, just to name a few. In fact, we're going to study a little bit detail as we go every week. The unique fragrance and flavor of ginger comes from its natural oils, and the most important of which is ginger oil. Now, ginger oil is a main bioactive compound in ginger. It's responsible for much of ginger's medicinal properties. Now, ginger oil has powerful anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects, according to research. So, for instance, it may help reduce oxidative stress which is the result of having an excess amount of free radicals in the body. So there are 11 health benefits of ginger that are supported by scientific research. We're going to study them as we go along. So 
top benefits simply very amazing food that god created for the healing of humanity ovarian cancer colon cancer morning sickness relief you get motion sickness you get an uh, speed um, reduces pain and inflammation and heartburn relief prevention of diabetic neuropathy and migraine relief menstrual cramps relief and cold and flu prevention so many things we will study as we go along so can we trust bible prophecy yes we can trust bible prophecy and today our topic is very important we're reading revelation chapter 20 and verse 15 it says if any man's name was not found written in the book of life he was thrown into the lake of fire everybody knows about lake of fire the whole world talks about it and hellfire and all of those things so this is what jesus is saying if your name is not in the book of life you will result in the lake of fire so bible is true and prophecy is true and that's why we're studying so today's topic names in the book of life whose names why how and what about the book of life does it really exist and that's what we're going to look at so let me set the stage as the plagues fall groups of armed men from every nation urged forward by evil angels prepare to slaughter god's people at the moment determining the decree so at the time draws near the saints will plead for divine protection while these armed men pursued them to their wilderness hideouts michael will then deliver his people from their murderous design so it is at midnight that god manifests his power for the deliverance of his people everything in nature seems turned out of its course and the stream ceases to flow dark heavy clouds come up and clash against each other and in the midst of the angry heavens is one clear space of indescribable glory whence comes the voice of god like the sound of many waters saying it is done we're talking about jesus second coming let us understand so michael the king of kings and lord of lords will then ride forth as a white horse with his army and smite the nations that have gathered together to make war against him that's revelation 19 11 to 19 if you read that's the context so the last plague will then fall and break the northern alliance so and there are many voices and thunders and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great and the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great babylon came in remembrance before god to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath and every island fled away and the mountains were not found and there were there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven and every stone about the weight of a talent and the men blasphemed god because of the plague of the hail for the plague thereof was exceeding great as ancient babylon was destroyed spiritual babylon will be overthrown you can read jeremiah 51 48 to 49 and revelation 18 21 to see the difference there and the contrast or the implications so this great city babylon will be divided into three parts of these three the beast and the false prophet and the wrought miracles before him will be cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone that's revelation 19 20. satan the dragon will no longer work violence against god's people and great babylon will never terrorize them again so the saints will be delivered everyone that shall be found written in the book that's daniel 12 and verse 1 c which we're studying today so the lord desires us to appreciate the great plan of redemption to realize our high privilege as the children of god and to walk before him in obedience with grateful thanksgiving he desires us to serve him in newness of life with gladness every day and he longs to see gratitude welling up in our hearts because our names are written in the lamb's book of life because we may cast all our care upon him who cares for us taken from christ object lesson so today's study let's read the whole verse and we're reading just we're just touching the last phrase of the verse and at that time shall michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time and at that time thy people shall be delivered everyone that shall be found written in the book so that's the last phrase that we're going to study here. so let's again little bit snapshot of the previous phrase of the text 
At that time, thy people shall be delivered. So just as the children of Israel were delivered at the end of the 10 plagues, so too will God's people in the end of time be delivered at the end of the seventh plague with his second coming. So in this extremely difficult time at the end of human history, the people of God experienced the intervention of Michael, that's Daniel 11, 1, and the great prince, that's Daniel 11, sorry, Daniel 8, 11, and Daniel 10, 21. He stands up, which means that he assumes rulership. Jesus will rescue all those written in the book. That's Daniel 11, 1, obviously the book of life, according to Revelation 21, 27. So let's understand this. Remember, as is in heaven, so is on earth. Let's understand something very clearly here. The Bible mentions several heavenly books in which the experiences and acts of human beings are recorded. Here we will explore the significance of those records in their particular function. It will become clear that human practices of record keeping employed in Israel and in other ancient Near Eastern countries are being used in the Bible to illustrate heavenly practices or to communicate some specific information concerning them. So at the same time, it will also become clear that the purpose of the heavenly records far exceed the social role of their earthly counterpart in Israelite society. So the study of this subject raises interesting questions with respect to the biblical use of cultural practices to describe heavenly ones. These we should briefly address in this presentation. So let's look at the social background of the book of life. It seems to have been common among Israelites to keep records of the names of those who dwelt in their cities. Those records or registers did not only serve to identify the citizens of a particular city, but were also used as genealogical records. You can read Nehemiah 7.5 and Nehemiah 12.23. In fact, the term register in the Old Testament could designate genealogical records usually kept by families and or by the city. You can do Ezra, Ezra 2.62 and Nehemiah 7.64 as well. So two main Hebrew terms are used to refer to registers. One is sefer, which designates a written record. You can read that in Deuteronomy 17.18. And a letter as found in 1 Kings 21.9. Or a geological, sorry, genealogical record found in Nehemiah 7.5 and 12.23. So other is ketab from a verbal root, which basic meaning is incise or inscribed. So it, des it designates a writing or a document. You can read Ezra 3, 14 and Ezra 8, 13. And a register as found in Ezekiel 13, 9 and Nehemiah 7, 64 and Ezra 2, 62. So there is none other type of register in Israel, a type of census taken for two main purposes, mainly to levy taxes or for military purposes. You can see that record in 2 Samuel 24, 1 to 9. So it appears that those who did not have children were identified in the city's registers as childless. You can read that in Jeremiah 22, 30. Now genealogies were important to determine legal rights and social, especially social and religious functions. For instance, the descendants of Aaron had a right to the priesthood and genealogy records identified those who belonged to his family. In the absence of that evidence, some were excluded from the priesthood. You can read as Ezra 2.62. The deletion of the name of a criminal from those registers would have been a severe legal punishment. This is precisely what the Lord announced against the false prophets. In Ezekiel 13.9, it says, They will have no place in the council of my people, nor will they be written down in the register of the house of Israel, nor will they enter the land of Israel. So Paul's prophets will not be part of the people of Israel. That is a clear point. Now mention should be made here of the book of the generations of Adam. You find in Genesis 5.1, which could be called a book of life and death in the sense that it included information about the birth of Adam's descendants and time when each one died. It is basically a genealogical record of Adam's descendants. So the book also includes an important exception to the fatal nexus birth death in the person of Enoch, that's Genesis 5, 24, who did not experience death. Now, Isaiah gives to the practice of keeping records of the inhabitants of the city an eschatological significance when they announce that in the Messianic kingdom. Now, Isaiah 4, 3 says this, 
he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. So, according to him, there is an eschatological register containing the names of those who will be citizens of the renewed Jerusalem. So, one could conclude that the register of a city may be called a book of life in the sense that the, those inscribed there had the right to live in that particular city and to enjoy the privileges and responsibilities associated with their being part of it. So the birth lists found in the Old Testament in the form of genealogies seem to provide a proper background for the interpretation of the Book of Life. The Bible refers quite often to the existence of a heavenly register in which the names of those who belong to the Lord are recorded. This book is located in heaven, that's Luke 10, 20, and is called your, your book, meaning God's book, which you have written, that's Exodus 32, 32, the book of life as found in Psalm 69, 28, and Philippians 4, 3, and the book of the Lamb as found in Revelation 17, 8, and it is also referred to through the use of the singular, the book, in Daniel 12, 1. So, Based on the Old Testament background discussed above, we should readily acknowledge that the heavenly book of life contains a particular list of names. But whose names are recorded there? Psalm 69, 28 states, May they, meaning my enemies, be blotted out of the book of life and may not be recorded with the righteous. That gives an idea. Since this psalm, the enemies of the psalmist appears to be Israelites, the text implies that only the names of the righteous, those who are part of the people of God, are recorded in his book of life. Particularly important is Psalms 87.6, where God is described as registering in the book the names of people who serve him in non-Israelite lands. And it says like this, The Lord will count when he registers the peoples. This one was born there. This appears to be a register of foreigners who worship the Lord and which includes the place where the person was actually born. So the reference is most probably to the book of life in which the names of non-Israelites are included as citizens among people of God. The New Testament indicates that the book of life contains only the names of those who are citizens of the New Jerusalem. Now Hebrews identifies those whose names are written in, written in heaven as the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. That's Hebrews 12, 23. Now, John also wrote in Revelation 21, 27, to say nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and laying shall ever come into it, meaning the city, but also those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, more explicit is Revelation 17, 8, where the followers of the beast are described as those whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. On the other hand, Jesus encouraged his disciples to rejoice because their names were recorded in heaven. That's Luke 10, 20. And Paul refers to his fellow workers as those whose names are in the book of life. That's Philippians 4, 3. We could conclude that only the name of the righteous are inscribed in the book of life. The scripture does not describe the process by which names are recorded in the book, heavenly book of life. Some have found in Revelation 17, 8 useful when dealing with this particular concern. There the followers of the beast are described as those whose name have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. So the implication appears that be that only the names of the servants of God had been written in that book from the foundation of the world. Obviously, the text describes divine foreknowledge. God knew in advance the name of those who will respond positively to the work of the Spirit in their lives and wrote their names in the book, but not predestination in the sense of an arbitrary decision that fixed the eternal destiny of every human being. The language of divine foreknowledge serves to emphasize this assurance of salvation. Within the arena of history, the inclusion of names in the book of life is based on the event of the cross, Revelation 13, 8, and appears to take place when the individual surrenders his or her life to the Lord. This is suggested by the fact that the name of a righteous person could be removed from the divine ledger because of unfaithfulness and sin. That awful possibility excludes the idea of predestination as defined above. In fact, the divine foreordination is thus linked with the human readiness to carry 
the conflict to victory. Now let's talk about deleting names from the book of life. The possibility of removing a name from the heavenly book of life is very real. Moses requested to the Lord to remove his name from your book, which you have written. That's Exodus 32, 32. He was asking Lord to exclude him from being part of his plan in that would make it possible for the Israelites who had sinned against him to be part of it. Now God's answer came back, whosoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of the book. That's Exodus 32, 33. Only an account of rebellious sin would a name be removed from the divine register. So the psalm is prayed with respect to the enemies. May they be blotted out of the book of life and may not be recorded with the righteous. That's Psalm 69, 28. So as already indicated, the enemies appear to have been among the righteous, but where they dealt with psalmist indicates that they were no longer righteous. And consequently, the psalmist asked that their names be blotted out of the book of life. Now, Revelation 3, 5 reaffirms the regrettable possibility of a righteous person falling from grace and having his or her name removed from the book. I would recommend read all these passages. They give you serious implications. Understand. So what about judgment, grace, and the book of life? Let's understand this concept. It is through a divine act of judgment that names are removed from the book of life. That's Daniel 7, 9 to 10, and describes a scene of judgment during which heavenly books are opened. So toward the end of the book of Daniel, the external verdict is announced. Everyone is found in the book of life, will be rescued and will enjoy everlasting life, but the others will experience disgrace and eternal contempt. You can read Daniel chapter 12, 1 and 2. We'll, we'll study chapter, verse 2 in our next sessions onwards. Notice that in Daniel 7, the reference to books in the plural, but in Daniel 12, we have the singular, the book. So as a result of the judgment, names are preserved in the book of life or removed from it. Interestingly, the first reference to the book of life is found precisely in the context of God's judicial activity against the sin of Israel. That's Exodus 32, 32. Now Moses uh, argues his case before the Lord based on the understanding that God's verdict against a person results in the removal of his or her name from the book of life. Now, John states that he who overcomes will thus be clothed with white garments and I will not erase his name from the book of life and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. That's Revelation 3, 5. So in the judgment where Christ represents his people and speaks on their behalf, those who overcome will be dressed in white garments and their names will be retained in the book of life. So they are acknowledged to be true citizens of the heavenly city, the New Jerusalem. That's Revelation 21, 27. So in the implication is that it is possible for believers to fall from grace and consequently to have their names blotted out from the book of life. So the book of life is also open during the judgment of the wicked after the millennium. You can read that in Revelation 20, 12. Since their names were not found in the book of life, that's Revelation 20, 15. They are not recognized as citizens of kingdom of God. So if the reason for removing a name from the book of life is sin, then natural human sinfulness would make it simply impossible to retain any name on that book. Romans 3.22 shows that. However, Moses was very much aware of the fact that only way to keep the name of the sinner in the book of life was through God's atoning work. Exodus 31.31, 32.31. Revelation 13.8 correlates the writing of names in the book of life with the atoning death of the Lamb of God. So we could conclude that writing down and retaining the name of the righteous in that book is an act of divine forgiving grace. That grace indicates the process and accomplishes, sorry, accompanies believers in their journey of faith and commitment to Christ. It is through their constant dependence on it that their names will be preserved in the book of life of the Lamb. They will be acknowledged as loyal citizens of the kingdom of God. So let's look at the nature of life in the book of life. The question of the nature of life mentioned in the name of the book of life is debated what? The references to that book in the New Testament clearly indicate that the noun life designates a eschatological life. That is eternal life in the kingdom of God. 
It is debatable whether the same meaning or a similar one can be assigned to the references to the Book of Life in the Old Testament. The tendency among scholars has been to interpret the Book of as referring to a book in which are inscribed either the names of all living persons or only that of the righteous. Now, removing the name of a person from that register would then mean that the person's life will be shortened. This interpretation is possible, but very unlikely. It weakens the sacrifice, sorry, significance of Moses' request to have his name blotted out of the book, God's book. Why would he make that petition if, after all, sooner or later, his name was going to be blotted out, out of the book? That is to say, he would die. Was he simply asking the Lord to shorten his life? To kill him? What would be the significance of that request? As we already suggested, he seemed to have had something more significant in mind. The blotting out of a name from the book is a divine act of judgment that alienates once and for all sinners from God and totally and permanently obliterates the person from the world of the living. It is a divine act of destruction. Read Deuteronomy 9.14. So according to Psalms 69, 28, blotting out of a name from the book of life does not mean that the person will simply die. It means that the person will not be able to enjoy life in the company of the righteous. This same idea is contained in Psalms 87, 6. The life mentioned in those passages is not available to the wicked. In fact, they are excluded from it. Therefore, the reference is not to a natural life that at some point will come to an end for both the wicked and the righteous, the name of the book of life seems to express an eschatological hope in the Old Testament. It is important to observe that the book of the generations of Adam, as found in Genesis 5.1, reveals with life in here and now, but at the same time points to a hope that transcends the present world of life and death. So it points to a life that overcomes the power of death and that it enjoyed in the presence of God. So the experience of Enoch appears to illustrate what would be the experience of those whose names are recorded in the heavenly book of life. For Enoch, the book of generations of Adam, the book of life and death was in fact a book of life, a life beyond grasp of death. So there is at least one passage in the Old Testament where the eschatological significance of the book of life is clearly indicated. Daniel 12.1, which we are studying today, states that retaining the name in the book of God means to enjoy eternal life. That is to say, a life in union with God after the resurrection. This discussion has some of the nature of eschatological hope in the important implications of Old Testament. The reference to the book of life in the Old Testament witness to the fact that there was in the Israelite faith an expectation for a life that will overcome death and that will be enjoyed in the company of God and the righteous. So let's look at the significance of the book of life. The biblical information concerning the book of life leads us to several important conclusions. Let's look at a few points. First, the nature of the heavenly book of life is unknown to us, but that should not lead us to question its reality. It is obvious that the Bible is using a social practice, keeping record of names of those who were citizens of a particular city or group to help us understand heavenly realities. The social practice illustrated and pointed to something more significant in the heavenly realm. Something happens to the at the administrative center of the universal government of God when a person becomes a citizen of his kingdom. The liberation of souls from the kingdom of darkness and their incorporation into the kingdom of God is not only celebrated in heaven, but recorded in the book of life. Secondly, the reality of the book of life underscores the people of God, the fact that those who belong to Christ are already members of the heavenly city and of the kingdom of God. Their names are already written in the heavenly register, and they are considered to be citizens of that kingdom with all the privileges, prerogatives, and responsibility that it entails. The certainty of their heavenly citizenship is so unquestionable that Jesus encourages them to rejoice because their names are already in the book of life. The certainty of that act is also emphasized in insisting that it is God himself who writes the names in the book and that his takes place in heaven and out of the reach of human envy and evil powers. Whatever may happen to the name recorded in heaven will be the result of the decision of a loving God. Thirdly, 
the decision to record the name of believers in the book of life is not arbitrary or accidental from the divine perspective the, and based on god's foreknowledge he inscribed on his book even before the foundation of the world the name of those who will believe now this decision was hidden in the divine counsel what that means is that writing the names of believers in the book of life was not a divine afterthought but part of the divine intention even before they actually and willingly decided to be members of the city of god now divine foreknowledge and human freedom do not cancel out each other fourthly it is possible for the name of a person to be removed from the heavenly book of life this is obviously based on the fact that god respects human freedom but believers are fully persuaded that what makes possible the inclusion of their name in that book is at the same time what makes it possible to retain it there namely the forgiving grace of god the names recorded there are those of repentant sinners as long as they persevere in faith retaining a spirit of dependence and submission to god through christ atoning work their names will not be blotted out during the judgment they are indeed citizens of the heavenly kingdom so there is also a book of good and bad deeds let's understand this besides the book of life there are biblical references to other heavenly books in which are recorded the deeds of human beings now daniel mentions books that were opened during the ecclesiastical judgment in daniel 7:10 and revelation also refers to those same books in revelation 20:12 there is little in the scripture about the nature of those books but what is available will be useful in an attempt to explore their significance and function so let's look at the social background of these books of deeds on earth probably the best parable for the heavenly books of good and bad deeds is found in the ancient practice of keeping record of the chronicles of the kings of israel and judah for instance there was a book called the book of deeds of solomon first kings 1141 which contained the acts of solomon and whatever he did and his wisdom this book is may have been used by the composer of the biblical book of kings to gather information about the king there are also references to the book of the chronicles of the kings of israel now first kings 14 19 15 31 16 5 14 and 20 27 22 and 32 39 second kings 1 18 and 30 34 13 8 12 14 and 15 and 28 and chapter 15 11 15 and 21 26 and 31 and the book of the chronicles of the kings of judah you find that in first kings 14 29 15 7 and 23 22 and 46 second kings 12 22 14 and 18 and 15 6 and 36 16 19 and and then 20 20 and 21 to 17 and 25 and 23 28 and 24 5 now those books contain information similar to what we find in the biblical book of kings they probably were a record of the chronicles of the kings of israel and judah or their royal annals so in the biblical books of Chron- chronicles several books of the deeds of the kings of judah are mentioned but the most common one is the book of the kings of judah and israel like in second chronicles 25 26 and 28 26 those royal annals contain the bo- good and bad deeds of the kings of israel and judah so the practice of preserving the activities of kings in chronological records was very common throughout the ancient near east in ezra there is a reference to the record books of the fathers of artaxerxes ezra 4:15 and in esther the book of chronicles of the kings of media and persia is mentioned that's esther chapter 10 2 and 2 and 23 so the book refers to have contained information concerning the activities of individuals who had come into contact with the king as found in Esther 6 and verse 1 so let's look at the heavenly books of deeds the belief in heavenly records of human deeds was widely spread throughout the east ancient near east we already mentioned several texts where that belief was expressed other ancient texts mention the tab- tablets of this misdeeds crimes errors oaths and also the tablets of good deeds so those references are not that common making it difficult for us to know the exact nature of the books in the ancient world and their purpose revelation 
20, 12 and 13 says this, and I saw the dead, small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead wherein which were in it and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works. So it's talking of the book of deeds in heaven. Now let's look at the contents of the books. In scripture, the heavenly books of human deeds are simply designated books. Daniel 7.10, Revelation 20.12, or the book in Psalms 56.8. There is only one passage where we find that appearance to be a specific name for it, the book of remembrance, Malachi 3.16. In some cases, there is some information which respect to what is written in them. For, in, for instance, they contain the painful experience of God's servants, Psalms 56.8. The acts of love performed on behalf of others, Nehemiah 13, 14, and the conversations of those who fear the Lord, that's Malachi 3, 16, and the evil acts of the wicked, that's Isaiah 65, 6. It is difficult to establish whether there are two different records, one for evil deeds and another for good deeds, or one record of all human deeds. The plural books suggest the possibility of at least two books. The fact that the Book of Remembrance contains the names of an ongoing account of the words and deeds of the God fearers suggests that only good deeds are recorded there. Now, Jewish traditions distinguish between a book in which are recorded the deeds of the righteous and the second one recording the deeds of the wicked. So, all of these words, now I'm reading from Great Controversy, all of these words I have written to you, I have commanded you to speak to the children of Israel that they might not commit sin or transgress the ordinances or break the covenant which are ordained for them so that they might do it and written down as friends. But if they transgress and act in all the ways of defilement, they will be recorded in the heavenly tablets as enemies and they will be blotted out of the book of life and written in the book of those who will be destroyed and those who will be rooted out from the land. And on the day that the children of Jacob killed Shechem, he wrote on high for them a book in heaven that they did righteousness and uprightness and vengeance against the sinners. And it was written down for a blessing. In martyrdom and ascension of Isaiah 9, 21 to 23, the prophet describes his experience while in vision in the seventh heaven. And I say to him, the angel, that I asked him in the third heaven, show me how everything which is done in the world that is known here and I, I was still speaking to him. Behold, one of the angels who were standing by, more glorious than that angel who had brought me up from the world, showed me some books, but not like the books of this world. And he opened them and the books had written in them, but not like the books of this world. And they were given to me and I read them. And behold, the deeds of the children of Israel were written there. Their deeds, which you know, my son Joseph. And I said, truly, nothing which is done in this world is hidden in the seventh heaven. So serious things for us to comprehend. So what is the function of the books? The primary function of these records is judiciary. That is to say, they preserve evidence that will be used in the divine tribunal to determine the nature of the commitment of the individual to the Lord. This is not clearly present in all the passages dealing with the books of human deeds, but it is clear enough to most of the passages to allow us to assign it to a central importance. Besides the book of deeds of the kings of Israel and Judah were ambiguously used by the biblical writers to judge the commitment or lack of commitment of the kings to the Lord. Serious things for us to comprehend. So usually when a king is introduced in the book of kings, a judgment formula is employed. A verdict is stated with respect to his relationship with the Lord. The experience of the king of Abijam illustrates the point. Now, Abijam became king over Judah. The verse continues. That's why the dotted line. It says, he walked in all the sins of his father. And his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, like the heart of his father, David. That's First Kings 15.3. So in other cases, we read, Jehoshaphat became king. And he did right in the sight of the Lord. That's Second Kings 12.1-2. So this judicial pronouncement was followed by an exposition of the evidence that supported it, which was taken from the chronicles of the kingdom and the record of the good and bad deeds performed by the king.
clearly the reign of each king is evaluated in terms of whether he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Example, 1 Kings 15, 11. Or whether he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. That's 2 Kings 13, 2. So, this is judgment by works. The concluding formula, the rest of the acts of, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of Judah, Israel and Judah. Now, alerts the reader to the fact that more evidence is available if needed to support the judgment passed on the king. In other words, the biblical writer is arguing that there is enough objective evidence recorded in the books of the deeds of the king to demonstrate beyond any doubt that the verdict for or against the particular king is legally justifiable. The same procedure is applied to Jeroboam in 1 Kings 13.33 and 14.19, to Asa in 1 Kings 15.3 to 15.23, and to Nadab in 1 Kings 15.26 and 31, and to Basha in 1 Kings 15.34 to 16.5, and to Eli in 1 Kings 16.13 to 14, and to Zimri in 1 Kings 16.19-20, and to Omri in 1 Kings 16.25 and 27, and to Ahab in 1 Kings 16, 30 to 34 and 22 to 29, and to Jehoshaphat in 1 Kings 22, 43 and 46, and to Ahaziah in 1 Kings 22, 52 and 2 Kings 1, 18, and to Johannes in 2 Kings 13, 2 and 8, and to Jehoshaphat in 2 Kings 13, 11 and 14 to 15, and Amaziah in 2 Kings 14, 3 and 18, and to Jeroboam in 2 Kings 14, 24 and 28, and in uh, to Azariah in 2 Kings 15, 3 and 6, and in to Zechariah in 2 Kings 15, 9 and 11, and to Manahem in 2 Kings 15, 18 and 21, and to Pekaniah in 2 Kings 15, 24 to 26, and to Gotham in 2 Kings 15, 34 to 36, and to Ahaz in 2 Kings 16, 2 and 9, and to Hezekiah in 2 Kings 18, 3 and 20, 20, and to Manasseh in 2 Kings 21, 2 and 7, and to Josiah in 2 Kings 22, 2 and 23, 28, and to Jehakim in 2 Kings 23, 37, 24 and 5. So the book of Kings seems to be taking all the kings of Israel and Judah to the divine tribunal to evaluate them based on their acts in history. So the use of the heavenly records of human deeds in the divine judicial proceedings is already present in Isaiah 65, 6. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay and I will repay into their bosom. So there is some ambiguity concerning the meaning of the expression, it is written before me. It could refer to the record of the sins of the people or it could designate a written decree of judgment that is immutable. So the context suggests that the reference is to the heavenly record of the sins of the people, which God at the moment of making a legal decision has in front of him. So after examining it, he determined not to keep silence. And that is to say, not to appear to be indifferent, but to act against sin. That's verse 7 of Isaiah 65. This indicates that what provoked this divine legal reaction is the sin of God's people, implying that what was written before the Lord was exactly that sin. So the books of good and evil deeds are opened particularly during the eschatological judgment before the kingdom of God is established on earth. So the scene of judgment in Daniel 7, 9 to 10 describes the divine tribunal in session and the use of books during the proceedings. So a similar scene is described in Revelation 20, 12. Now, during the judgment of the wicked, it is explicitly stated that the final and immutable verdict is based in what was written in the books. All were judged according to the deeds as recorded in the heavenly books. So Revelation 20, 12 says this, and I saw the dead, small and great stand before the God and the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, blotting out recorded deeds from the books. Let's understand this. Nehemiah 13, 14 suggests an intriguing idea with the respect of the book of deeds. He requested that his loyal deeds may not be blotted out from the heavenly records. The possibility of deleting good deeds from those records suggests that evil deeds could also be blotted out from them. The idea is found in one ancient Near Eastern text in the collection of Sumerian and Akkadian incantations. Now it reads, may his sin be shed today, may it be wiped off from averted from him, 
May the record of his misdeeds, his errors, his crimes, his oaths, all that is sworn be thrown into the water. So in the scripture, misdeeds are eliminated or blotted out from the heavenly registers, not through the incantations, but through repentance and divine grace. Psalms 51.1, Isaiah 43.25, Isaiah 44.22, Acts 3.19, and Ezekiel 18.21-22 highlights that. Sins are not blotted out of the heavenly books are forgiven, unforgiven sins. Okay, Sins that are not blotted out of the heavenly books are unforgiven sins. Psalms 109.14 highlights that. So, the blotting out recorded deeds from the books. Perhaps Nehemiah's statement implies that during the final judgment, the few good deeds performed by the wicked or by those who turned from righteousness to wickedness will not make any difference with respect to their final destiny. Their evil deeds will reveal that they did not remain in the permanent covenant relationship with God. The idea is well expressed in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 24, it says, But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and does according to all the abominations that a wicked man does, he will he live? All his righteous deeds which he had done will not be remembered for his treachery which he has committed and his sin which he has committed for he will die. So instead of the verb blot out, we have here the verb remember, preceded by negation, will not be remembered. So not to remember deeds in the equivalent of blotting them out from the heavenly books. This is explicitly stated in Isaiah 43, 23. It says, I, even I, I am he who wipes out your transgressions from for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. That's Nehemiah 13, 14 as well. So guilt or virtue can under certain circumstances be removed from the divine registers. Now let's look at the significance of the books of human deeds. An omniscient God does not need to keep records of the life of human beings but they could be very useful to all intelligent cre creatures, including human beings. Heavenly creatures seem to be involved in the procedures of the final judgment. Daniel 7, 10, 1 Corinthians 6, 2, and Revelation 24. Since the Bible does not discuss the nature of those records, they remain shrouded in mystery. However, the significance of those records for us is important and very relevant. So, the significance of the books of deeds. Firstly, those records indicate that God is interested in every one of us as individuals. In the Old Testament, the book of Chronicles were mainly a record of the activities of the kings and the impact of their actions on their persons. Now, they were the most important leaders among the people of God and their actions were preserved in the records for future generations. So, in the heavenly records, no distinction is made among human beings. We are all equally important before the Lord and what we do, so, say and experience is recorded there. Each one of us plays a significant role in the conflict between good and evil and our actions reveal that particular function. So we are not born to exist for a short period of time and then return to it, eternal oblivion without leaving traces of our presence on this planet. So God created us and allowed us to become what we are through our experiences, decisions, and actions. So the history of our lives is preserved by God in the heavenly records as a witness to the fact that he considered our presence here a significant value. Secondly, the record is not only about our actions, but about God's involvement in the lives of humans. Humans may at times feel that they're facing life by themselves, without the supporting and guiding presence of God. But the heavenly records will reveal that God was always present and them leading, guiding, and trying to influence their lives. The record of our lives is at the same time a record of the involvement of the king of the universe in every facet of our experience in the world of sin. So in other words, the books of human deeds are in fact the books of the chronicles of God in which are recorded his activities on behalf of every sinner on this rebellious planet. Our actions are recorded there because he all was always present in every one of them, seeking us out, extending to us his loving hand of salvation. So, in the records, as preserved God's providential care and guidance, as we were confronted by challenges and choices that forced us to make decisions 
for or against him. So thirdly, the fact that human deeds are recorded in heaven in some form implies that they are accessible to others for objective analysis. So those records play a valuable role during the final judgment in the heavenly realm in that they testify concerning God's impartial judgment. He was established that the faith commitment of every individual to him and to his son is revealed through human actions and that becomes a defining concept during the judgment. So the examination of those records will once and for all unveil before God's intelligent creatures the justice of God's judicial decisions and will lead to the extent extermination of sin and sinners from God's creation. So the examination of the books of deeds will close with a universal doxology in which God and the Lamb will be praised by all creation for their love and justice in all their actions. This is Revelation 19, 1 and 2. So how will the judgment take place? Briefly, all the decisions in judgment are based on the content of the books that are opened. Those books are among others one, the book of life, which we're talking about, which contains the name of those who accepted Christ. Exodus 32, 31 to 33, Psalm 69, 28, and Philippians 3, 4, and Revelation 3, 5. And secondly, the book of deeds, which contains the record of everything we do. That's Revelation 20, 12. And the book of remembrance, talks which contain special individual and collective actions that the saints did, as found in Psalms 56, 8, and Malachi 3, 16. So, the investigation in the judgment, the books of heaven. Just example, Exodus 32, 32 says, Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. That's what we are need to understand. Now let's look at verse 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against him, him will I blot out of the book. Another example of these books is to read the mention of these books in Revelation 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, and 9. And the book of life of the Lamb is Philippians 4, 3, Revelation 13, 8, and Revelation 17, 8, Revelation 20, verse 12, 15, and Revelation 21, 27, and Revelation 22, 19. So, God investigates, just briefly some example. In Adam and Eve, God followed the same steps in all of his judgments. Those steps are investigating, deciding, and executing. That is why the first phase of the judgment is called investigative judgment, which is happening right now. Soon, the second phase will happen, and then finally, the third phase after the millennium. Adam and Eve, Genesis 3, 9-4, investigation integrates Adam and Eve, and then his decision, he issued a verdict, and the execution, they were expelled from Eden. What about Cain? Genesis 4, 9-16, investigation happened, he integrated Cain, and a decision, he issued a verdict, and then was an execution. Cain was expelled from his land. What about Tower of Babel? Genesis 11, 4 to 9. Investigation happened. He came down to see what they were doing. And the decision, he decided to punish them by confusing their language. And the execution is, he scattered them all over the face of the earth. What about Sodom? Genesis 18, 16 to 19, 28. There is an investigation. Two angels came to investigate. Decision is made. He issued the verdict. And the execution happened. Sodom, Gomorrah, and Jerusalem were destroyed. So. Conclusion, our study of the heavenly book suggests that heavenly things, in this case, the heavenly records are being patterned after earthly practices. That is to say, the social practice of keeping records of people in the from birth lists, genealogies and chronicles appear to be projected into the operations of the heavenly realm. The question is whether the earthly practices are being used in the Bible as metaphors to help us understand theological concepts and ideas, but were not intended to describe similar procedures in heaven, it is difficult to provide an answer to that question. It is clear that the biblical writers were persuaded of the reality of the heavenly books. Hence, we must ask, should we feel free to dispose of their convictions in order to appropriate only abstract ideas from the language and images they used, that they may not be necessarily wrong? However, the question we are raising probably would have never occurred to an Israelite. Hebrew thinking does not seem to allow for the argument that earthly patterns are simply being used to convey heavenly concepts for which there is no, at some level, a concrete correspondence in heaven itself. This does not necessarily mean that the heavenly things have to correspond in every respect to the earthly ones. The biblical writers are clearly using heaven language, sorry, human language, 
and images to allude to a heavenly reality that cannot be fully contained in the language or in the social practices that are employed to communicate their message. So finally, the phenomenon we are describing is very similar to the biblical tendency to pat pattern human things on earth after the heavenly ones. For instance, the earthly sanctuary was patterned after the divine, Exodus 25, 8. Evidently, that should not be interpreted to mean that the earthly is an exact replica of the heavenly. The biblical writers were aware of the superiority of the heavenly temple vis-a-vis -vis the earthly. Another example comes from the sphere of human behavior. In the Old Testament, the religious and social behavior of the Israelites was to be patterned after the heavenly one. So the Israelite society was expected to reflect the heavenly model. Be he holy, for I am holy. That's Leviticus 11.44. Leviticus 19.2 and Leviticus 27 and 26. But the holiness of the people was a pallid reflection of the unique of the magnificent holiness of God. In fact, it was a limited participation in the holiness of God. Therefore, one should not press the discontinuity between earthly and heavenly or the heavenly and the earthly to point of denying the reality of the heavenly. So the specific nature of the heavenly is not accessible to us but inaccessibility should not be equated with non-existence. So we're talking in the book of life. We studied a lot. I hope and pray that um, our names will be found in the book of life. That's the conclusion of the whole matter. Revelation 20, 12 very clearly talks about it. Revelation 13, 8 very clearly talks about it. Those who have the mark of the beast, their names will not be in the book of life. So we need to understand and comprehend that God has a book and name should be written in that book. That's what the seven, the seals talk about, that Jesus, the lamb that went up to heaven, opened the seals and the names were opened up for people to now have the access to enter heaven based on what they have done in their lives. So there's a choice to make. The devil wants to take people down and not have their names in the book of life. Who will you choose? God that created heaven and earth in them and all that in them there is, or the God of this earth. There's no third option. Because the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knows that he hath a short time. That's Revelation 12, 12. Jesus is saying, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. There shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore I say, Enter the ark of hope. The antediluvians had the ark that Noah was asked to build, and those who entered survived. The rest perished. Today, the ark of hope is the ark of the covenant. God is sitting on his throne. His foundation is the Ark of the Covenant, inside which is the law of God, which he governs the universe. And he wants everybody to abide and have his law in their lives. That is simply law of love. Love for God and love for fellow men. He stands at the door and knock. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. If you have Jesus in you, hang on to him. Don't let him off. If you don't have Jesus, I would recommend this Jesus for you because he is the only hope where you can have eternal life with him, with God forever. Meaning no sickness, no sorrow, no pain, no problems and issues and difficulties that we face today. None of them. He will wipe out everything, including our tears. That is the promise and that is what he's coming for. So whether people like it or not, whether people ready or not, whether people believe it or not, every year shall hear about Jesus coming. And he will come once everybody makes their choices. It is good to make informed decisions. And that is why we are studying. My question to you finally is, are you ready to meet Jesus? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace of giving us understanding of what you have revealed to us so that we as human beings could study and understand. And as we understand that um, the days are coming, we have to be uh, diligent led by your Holy Spirit, by the grace of your mercy that you want to restore us into your image, I pray that you would give us that grace. Because when names are looked upon, that you would see yourself and that you would be able to rejoice and say, I to that kingdom. Effort us the grace and lead us in those paths. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you one. Thank you all for joining with us and may God be with you.